Hi, welcome back. In this, the ninth session that I'm doing on my data update for 2017, I'd like to focus on dividends and more generally on how much cash companies return to investors. I don't know whether any of you have seen the old Rodney Dangerfield uh, scene where he says, I get no respect. No. And dividend decisions, decisions, in my view, are like the Rodney Danger field of corporate finance. They get no respect and they don't get much attention either from academics or practitioners. In many companies, the way you pay dividends is you look at what you've done historically. It's based on inertia or me tooism. What's everybody else doing? Or in some cases, trying to get a magic bullet. Let's do this. If, if we do this, the stock price will go up. And that surprises me. And here's why. If you're a farmer and you plant crops, love your I'm sure you love farming and you love play, you know looking after your crops but the payoff comes from harvesting your crops if you're an investor and you invest in companies I know you love the fact that they take great projects and you might like the way they tweak their financing mix but ultimately your harvest comes from the cash they return to you so I would think that in a company you would pay more attention to how you harvest your crops or how you return cash to stockholders Let's think about how dividends would be set in a logical word. And here's what I mean by a logical word. Dividends are cash flows to equity. And equity is a residual claim, right? So it should be the last claim on the cash flows. So if you think about the sequence that companies should follow to pay dividends, here's how it should start. It should start with the cash flows that you get from your operations as equity investors. In other words, it should be net income plus non-cash charges, depreciation, amortization. That's your starting number. From that, you need to set aside whatever you need to reinvest to grow in the future, in working capital or in long-term assets. Then, if there's any, if you're if you're able to go out and raise money, you're going to bring in cash. But if you have to pay off debt, you got to pay off that cash. You take care of your financing cash flows. So you start with your investing investing cash flow. Then you look at new investments you got to make. Then you look at your financing cash flows. And what you're left with after you've met every conceivable need is your potential dividend. Now, of course, you could end up with a negative cash flow, in which case you can't or should not be paying dividends. But that's the way I think about dividends. I call this a potential dividend. Sounds fancy, but essentially it is whatever cash is left over after your reinvestment needs, after your debt cash flows. I call this free cash flow equity. That free cash flow equity is what you can afford to pay out of dividends. Now, do you have to pay it out as dividends? Not necessarily. There are three things you can do with this free cash flow equity. The first is you can hold it as cash. Nothing stops you as a company from doing it. For what? For meeting a future need for uh, future reinvestments, you could pay it as dividends or as special dividends, or you could buy back stock. So in a logical world, this is the way the process should work. And it actually gives you an interesting insight as to how dividends should evolve as a company ages. A young startup should already have negative cash flows. You're losing money, you reinvest on top. It shouldn't be returning any cash. That's easy. A young growth company, still negative cash flows. Why are you making very little money? You're reinvesting a lot. You can't afford to go out and borrow money. Still, you shouldn't be paying dividends. As you mature as a company, you start to see your potential dividend open up. And here's why. You're starting to make more money. And as your growth drops off, you're reinvesting less. And as your cash flows mount, you can afford to borrow money. In a sense, you get the trifecta. And as that trifecta comes together, your capacity to pay dividends opens up. Now, initially, you're going to fight it. Why? Because nobody wants to be a, grow a, a mature company. It's so much more fun being a growth company. So initially, your cash ba balance balloons out. But at some point in time, the pressure builds up. The pressure builds up to borrow money and pay more dividends, and eventually you start doing it. And as a mature company, you enter the golden age of cash return. Because why? You're a mature company. The earnings come in. You don't have much in reinvestment needs. You can return a lot of cash to your stockholders. But even mature companies at some point in time are going to decline. When you go to decline, here's what happens. You tend to still continue to make money even though that money might be shrinking. You, you might be making less net income than you did the previous year. Rather than reinvest, you're actually divesting businesses. So you're getting cash inflows from that second step. And you might have to pay off debt, but you can still return a lot of cash. You're, in a sense, partially liquidating yourself over time as you get smaller. And eventually, the game ends. You liquidate yourself. So in a logical world, this is the way dividends should be set. Now let's look at how companies actually set dividends. 
Rather than start with investments, move on to financing, and then look at what's left over as paying as dividends, many companies, here's what happens. The company decides what it's going to pay out to stockholders first. I'm saying, you're saying that doesn't make any sense. They do it based on their history. So they have a history of paying dividends. They feel this urge to continue to pay dividends. On top of that, they look at everybody else in the sector. If everybody else in the sector is paying dividends, they continue to pay dividends. And if everybody else increases dividends, they feel the urge to increase dividends. And then they look for magic bullets. If another company in the sector is buying back stock and sees its stock price jump, they say, I can do that too. So what many companies do is they start with how much cash to return. So they do that. Then they look at their operating cash flows to see if they have enough cash to cover the cash return they've already decided to make. Well, hopefully you do. And if you do, you return all the cash. But if you don't, they are actually already in the hole. Then if they if they have any cash left over after paying dividends, they say, okay, maybe I should invest now. What happens as a consequence, you'll now be turning away good projects because you paid out all that cash as dividends. And finally, and this becomes the deepest cut is you get deeper and deeper into the hole. In other words, you paid out a huge amount of cash and dividends. You took a few investments, but you're still in the hole. You might go out and borrow money or even issue stock. That's completely dysfunctional to be issuing stock and paying dividends. But dividend policy, for some reason, seems to invite dysfunctional thinking. So let's think of it. Let's look at how this plays out at companies. In fact, if you ask, if you ask me to come up with one word to describe how companies pay dividends around the world, it's sticky. What do I mean by that? Take a look at this graph. This looks at the proportion of U.S. companies each year that increase dividends. That's a red. That's a red column. Decrease dividends. That's a yellow column. And do nothing to dividends. It's a purple column. In every, every year since 1988, guess who wins? In every single year, 55, 60, 65, even 70% of companies pay as dividends what they did last year. Most companies in most years, at least in the U.S., pay out what they did last year. That's sticky. And in fact, that practice is not just in the U.S. You see it around the world, though there are parts of the world where rather than dividends, absolute dividends being sticky, it's dividend payout ratios. The percentage of earnings that you pay is sticky. That's especially true in Latin America. So dividends are sticky. Dividends are also increasingly being replaced by stock buybacks, at least in the U.S. And this graph kind of brings that home. In 1988, U.S. companies returned about 30% of their cash and buybacks, 70% in dividends. And that number was actually, if you go back to 1981 or 82, 90 to 95% of the cash returned by U.S. companies took the form of dividends. Take a look at the 90s because something clearly is going on. You see the proportion of cash being returned by, uh, to stockholders in buybacks climbed to 50, 55, 60%. And barring one year, 2009, you see that this, this has become... The, the, the fact rather than the exception. U.S. companies have increasingly turned to stock buybacks as a way of returning cash to stockholders. We can think of lots of reasons. Some might be specific to the company. Managers are rewarded with options. Maybe they don't feel the need to pay dividends. They prefer to buy back stock. Maybe it's because companies are less certain about future earnings. But this is beyond debate now. Companies in the U.S. at least are increasingly shifting to buybacks as a way of returning cash to stockholders. So now let's think about how we measure how much companies return to their stockholders. The two first me metrics that I'll use are very old metrics. The first divides dividend by market cap. It's called the dividend yield. It's the return you as an equity investor get from traditional dividends. Everything else now has to come from price appreciation. The second is called the dividend payout ratio, which is dividends divided by net income. And of course, this is computed only if net income is positive. If it's negative, this payout ratio is not meaningful and not available. And it measures what percent percentage or proportion of earnings a company is paying out as dividends. The balance is held back by the company to reinvest or hold as cash. The third is a more generic measure that comes from the last graph where increasingly companies are turning to buybacks, where I take dividends plus buybacks and I divide by potential dividends. Presumably a company that is returning all that it can, this ratio should be 100%. If this ratio is less than 100%, companies are building up cash balances. If it's greater than 100%, they're drawing on past cash balances or issuing equity. So let's see how these numbers play out around the world. Let's look at dividend yields and payout ratios first. This is a, this is a picture of what these ratios look like around the globe. 
If you look at the U.S., for instance, the dividend yield is between 1% and 2%. In India, for instance, less than 1%. Basically, it all, so I've graphed out dividend yields here, and if you go to the live map, you can actually see payout ratios. You can see that dividend yields and payout ratios vary widely across the world. Now, I could give you logical reasons why this might be. High-growth countries should pay out less in dividends in low-growth countries. Countries with strong corporate governance will pay out more in dividends. Why? Because stockholders can put pressure. You can look across the world and form your own hypotheses, but I decided that might be better for you to look at a much more condensed regional comparison. So this compares the world as it looked at the start of 2017. I have the dividend yield each year. I also have a cash return yield. This dividends plus buybacks as a person of market cap. So you take a look at the U.S., the dividend yield is low, 1.93%. But if you add the stock buybacks, that number jumps to about 4.3%. India remains an outlier, only 1%. Of, so the collective cash return is only about 1% of market cap. And again, you can look for your own rationale for this, but you can essentially see the variation across the world in how much companies return in dividends. And clearly there are big differences, some related to history, some related to tax rates in these countries and how investors get taxed, and some related to corporate governance. Now let's take a look at cross-sectional comparisons across companies. So this is a graph of dividend payout ratios both across U.S. companies and global companies of just dividend paying stocks. And the reason I emphasize that is in the U.S. there are more companies that don't pay dividends than pay dividends. The median payout ratio for a U.S. company is 0%. So this is among that subset of companies, the 40% of U.S. companies that actually pay dividends. And here's what you see. The median dividend payout ratio in the U.S. is about 42%. That's a median. The 25th percentile is 24%. The 75th percentile is 75%. You can see in Japan, the median payout ratio is much lower than it is in the U.S. And you're going to see this play out somewhere else, but keep that in mind. There are big variations in payout ratios, especially if you focus on the median, especially with Japan being the outlier. If you look at dividend yields, you see much more similarity between Japan and the U.S. But remember, again, in the U.S., you also get that significant buyback on top. Again, you can see that the median dividend yields are highest in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And there might be a reason for that. There are a substantial number of natural resource companies in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. They have paid dividends historically, and now that commodity prices are down, they seem to continue to pay the dividends the way they used to. So let's look at what sectors are the largest cash return sectors in the U.S. and which ones have the least cash return. If you're interested in looking at the global comparison, take a look at the link that I'm going to put to this, this session and you can see what these numbers look like globally. So if you look at these, so these are the sectors which return the largest percentage of net income in the form of dividends and buybacks. A surprise, right? Right there, software. You think of software, you think about a tech company. Tech companies are supposed to be growth companies. They're not supposed to return cash. This might be a reason for you to re-examine what exactly a tech company is because there are older tech companies and younger tech companies. There are some older tech companies that are really way past mature in their life cycle. They're more declining companies. There are some companies here that are not a surprise. So for instance, oil and gas. I already talked about dysfunctional dividend policy, how companies stuck pay, get stuck paying dividends that they historically have, and natural resource companies are among the most dysfunctional companies when it comes to dividends. For some reason, they feel the urge to maintain dividends even as oil prices or gold prices or iron ore prices drop by 40, 50, or 60 percent. So take out of this whatever you might, but you can see it's a mix of sectors. There's no easy way to explain some of these sectors. And if you look at the sectors that return the least cash, notice that there are, there are about three real estate related sectors. This might be the residue of 2008. Real estate companies perhaps got so burned by that last crisis that they're holding back. There are some cyclical companies obviously holding back cash, auto and truck and chemical. But there are again, the, the other end of the tech spectrum, you see a lot of online tech companies that are in fact among the least cash return. In fact, I had a post a while back about the aging of the tech sector, how old tech companies are very different from young tech companies. So maybe this is again a signal that we should stop lump lumping all tech companies together because they're starting to diverge. Now let me make the final piece of this session about cash balances. Because when you talk about dividends, you're also talking about cash balances, and here's why. If you think about how cash balances at companies accumulate, 
It's from companies holding back from potential dividends. So if you have $100 in potential dividends and you pay out only $40, 60 that you didn't pay out has to go into your cash balance because remember this potential dividend is already after reinvestment and debt payments there's no other place for it to go other than into the cash balance so if you keep doing this year after year you're going to accumulate a large cash balance hey how do you think apple has a 250 billion dollar cash balance in january 2017 it's years of holding back on cash so if a company issues new no new equity the only way you accumulate a large cash balance is by holding back cash so let's take a look at what cash balances look like around the world. And this is again a graph that compares cash balances globally and across companies. So it's a kind of a bimodal distribution. You have some companies that have very little cash and some companies that have lots of cash, more than 25% of the value. Looking across the world, you can already see the outlier. Remember Japan had the smallest payout ratio in the world? It also has companies with the most cash in the world. The median cash balance for a Japanese company is about 22% cash. So the next time you invest in a Japanese company, take a look at how much cash you're, you're probably getting a company that is substantially cash and maybe a little bit of automobiles and software on the side. The U.S. has the smallest cash balance. Remember we talked about corporate governance. The U.S. also has the most activist investors who tend to put pressure on companies return cash. Now there are some of you this is a bad thing. I tend to think of this as a mixed blessing because I think without those activist investors you're going to get Japan. Around the rest of the world cash balance is the median around 5% but you have some companies that are 15, 20, 25% cash and that skews what you're going to see in this company in terms of price earnings ratios, price to book ratios, returns in equity. So take a look at cash because it's not just something that's a small item on a balance sheet. So here's my closing. I think that if you look at dividends, it really don't make sense as a way of returning cash on stocks. And here's why. If stock is a residual claim, then dividend should be a residual claim. It shouldn't be a fixed number. You're saying, but it's always been that way. It reflects the history of equities. Remember, equities came to financial markets after bonds. So people had to be induced. In, so these were bond investors that had to get to buy stocks. And the only way you could get them to buy stocks was to say, hey, look, we'll pay you something like a coupon. So dividends were your way of attracting investors in the bond market. That was in the late 1800s. We're in 2017. Maybe it's time to let go of this notion of dividends being a fixed claim. Because as I argued, companies get into really bad straits by sticking with dividends when they really should be cutting dividends. But I'll also tell you, it's going to be difficult to make this change on both sides. Why on both sides? Well, investors in some companies are used to dividends. That's the way they think about stocks. In fact, there's a whole area of value investing built on the notion that dividends are predictable and that's what you should go for. On the other side, there are companies who are so used to paying a fixed dividend that they can't think out of the box. So this will require a little bit of work, but I think the process is started. In fact, on that table where I show you cash return by region, go back and take a look at that table. You're going to see stock buybacks are picking up not just in the U.S., but around the world. We're looking for a more flexible way of returning cash to stockholders. And if it's not, not stock buybacks, maybe there's a different version of dividends we should be looking for. Because it really doesn't make sense to pay the same amount in dividends year after year after year after year in a year where earnings are in, in, a, in a world where earnings are getting much more difficult to predict. That's about it. Thank you very much for listening.